Thank you to our first joint coffee talk with Eric Shatner, our police chief, and Mike McQuillan. Thank you. Chief McQuillan, uh, fire. Fred, our highway guy, myself, uh, Scott, and Kristen. All right, so it's an open forum. Uh, our audience is limited, but if you have any questions, please feel free to uh, just ask away. That's the whole point behind Coffee Talk is to find out what's on your mind and what we can do. So uh, if you want to, gentlemen, want to start with maybe a recap of your traffic safety advisory committee meeting and let folks in town know what's going on, that would rock. All right, so the uh, traffic safety advisory uh, meeting that just ended uh, was uh, great attendance. Uh, probably had about, what, 15, 16 residents uh, expressing their concerns over traffic, um, requesting signs, lights, crosswalks. Uh, it's all stuff we understand, um, but uh, everything has a financial impact, and uh, we will be bringing that forward um, through our next meeting. I meet with the select board on Monday night with a few of the sign requests that we approved uh, this evening. Um, uh, in general, I mean, we're just inundated with traffic with the 290 project, and uh, there's no end in sight. Uh, I think once the 290 project finishes, South Street will probably be closed, so those 4,000 4, plus cars a day will then be diverted over to Pleasant Street um, for daily commuting. Um, so it's a nonstop existing uh, issue we have in town with traffic. Could you go back and explain why South Street will be closed? <laughs> well, as, as most people know, uh, one of the bridges on South Street is due to be replaced. Um, we're hoping for an anticipation of spring of 2024, if not the fall of 2024, for a uh, construction date, uh, which would probably be right around the time that uh, the 290 project finishes. And, uh, and then we'll be sending our traffic again over to Pleasant Street. Um, they are saying that once it is closed, it should only take a couple months for the bridge to be replaced. Actually, the, is there an update for like the timing on the 290, 495 interchange? Originally, they were supposed to be done this month. Um, they've extended that to a date of spring 24. So whether it's March, April, maybe May, June, um, they have they've have extended it. So I would anticipate right through July 4th. I think that's probably their target is to get open for July 4th. Chief McQuillan, any updates from fire that you can share to the town folk when they watch this back? Um, we had the open house on Saturday, which was a great event, uh, well attended. We had 200 people that showed up throughout the uh, day, so even with the weather that we were anticipating was going to be poor, uh, it was still a great showing, and we actually, uh, things worked out. It was a rain-free day for us, uh, so we were outside and we had a lot of demonstrations, so um, it went well. Mr. Highway Guy, anything you want to share? You know what, and I want to send a, a shout out to Fred and his highway. I saw on Facebook some, I'm not going to say the words that I want to say, people or peoples left trash on Lyman, the upper end of Lyman, I'm assuming up by, uh, uh, right at the yeah, right, at, so thank you to Highway for coming and cleaning our streets and shame on you if you've been dumping your crap on the side of the road. course we have updates um, so just recently we've started into uh, an agreement for a complete streets program uh, a project up in the center of town um, it's going to be on the Woodward side of, of uh, the center we're going to be putting a new sidewalk in down the left side of the street to connect um, the existing from the library down to uh, Central Street and we're going to do a section from where it ended on 
the cemetery side up to where uh, the center store is. And the last section might just be the improvements for uh, Carter Street going up along the church that was done uh, back in 2012 when uh, the bicentennial came through. Um, I'm not sure when that's actually going to take place. They just submitted the grants for it. So hopefully we'll know soon. And no real update on the South Street Bridge. Um, the last we had done was the drill boring was done. Um, now I think they're in the design phase. Uh, they're starting to create the actual uh, bridge on paper. And once they have that, then we'll be able to uh, know when we're going to be putting that on. Do you have any update on the uh, pedestrian blinky lights that are constantly blinking and not like push button activated? Of course I do. So we're actually going to incorporate those in with the Complete Streets program uh, because right now we don't have a way to protect them if we were to put them up. Um, so that was all figured in. And w the way the grant was written uh, was that the town was going to supply them, even though we already have them. Um, they were like points towards uh, getting the project approved. Any questions from our audience before we uh, keep going? Nice. All right. Um, actually, I've, I have a question um, from one of our residents to Chief Shatna. <laughs> um, can police enforce no ATVs on any of the conservation trails in town, and if so, how? Uh, we, we can definitely enforce it if we can catch them. Um, you know, like a lot of people have to realize that we have full-size cars they're on small trails um, you know we're more than happy to start an ATV unit to go after them but with everything uh, there's a huge in cost endured um, it's not just getting the equipment it's the training that goes behind it as well as outfitting the officers with the proper equipment uh, when I looked at this four years ago with Chief Galvin I think it was right around thirty five hundred dollars per officer to outfit them with the correct uniform uh, for the UTV or ATV, uh, as well as purchasing a ATV or UTV uh, in order to enforce those laws to go after them. We, we have an ATV, don't we, for the town? Uh, we do have a UTV. It's uh, sitting right there. Uh, definitely not outfitting, outfitted for going after people. That's for rescuing people. All right. Chief Mike, I have a question for you. Um, we chatted on Saturday about the trash on Linden Street left by CSX. Uh, any update on the Jones Road? Um, yeah, it looks lovely. They picked up the trash. They're like all the metal is one place. What about the other two spots in town that look like crap? That's a good question. Um, I did send an email to the operations manager that I had from CSX, and I have not gotten a response. Um, I did speak to one of the crews actually at Jones Road to ask them about it, and they said that they would get on that because it was an eyesore. Um, and apparently they did Jones Road, but I'm guessing they haven't gone much else. So I'll see if I can find another crew to follow up with to see if they can pick up after themselves. But that's the only update I have is that I've sent an email and got nothing in return. I have other questions, but I don't want to go, hog. Do you have questions? No, go, go. go for it. Okay. Kristen, um, can you please provide an update to the town on the facility and energy assessments? Can you hear me? Excellent. I sure can, Peg. So we are doing a facilities assessment and uh, building uh, space assessment as well. And that includes an energy audit component to it. So the town went out to bid earlier this year for a consulting firm to do this survey. And we have engaged a firm. They are going to be going around to the different buildings and facilities in town that are town owned. That includes like South Commons, uh, curatorial building, Bullard House, obviously all of the main town municipal buildings and some of the lesser used town buildings. Basically going through and doing an initial survey 
to look at systems, um, look at roofs, basically make a determination on whether the building should be uh, rehabbed, what the preventative maintenance needs are, and ultimately they do a calculation to determine if more funding should be put into the building or not which is actually going to be really useful for us because I think they're probably going to find in some of our older buildings, there's going to be some preventative maintenance uh, or uh, deferred maintenance rather um, that may or may not make sense in light of the condition of the building to do. So then what we would look at is whether or not we want to keep or sell those buildings, um, what the best option is to do from there. We also, as we've talked about before, there are storage issues in town, so kind of looking at space needs as a whole. And they are going to actually catalog, uh, um, catalog and inventory all of the systems in each building. So they go through and they look at the boilers, they look at the electrical systems, they look at the equipment, they get the model numbers, the years that they were put in. And then they basically make a determination of what our capital needs are going to be up to five to 10 years out. So it's a pretty comprehensive study that looks at a lot of different aspects of the building. And I would like to thank Peg Stone, Janet Lamy, Amy Grenier, Fred Cummings, our chiefs. And um, I know I'm forgetting people um, that have been helping us to complete this uh, study. But it is a big undertaking. There's a lot of information they need to collect on each of the buildings. Um, but I think it's going to glean, we're gonna have a lot of valuable information that we can actually keep up to date going forward uh, to make sure we maintain our buildings properly and to give us an idea of what those costs will be going forward. Do you have a date when we'll have the data back and can start to plow through it and look through it? So the uh, preliminary surveys are going to happen in November, uh, October and November, they should be complete uh, by around the end of November. So I expect early next year, we will be seeing the results. Uh, Kristen, yes. um, I don't know if you believe it or not, but town meeting is in May and budget season has already started. It has. It, it has to start because there's a lot of work involved. Um, if you give sort of an outline of the process and are there places, because I think if people uh, want to sort of influence the budget, think we should be spending more money on something or less money on something, now is the time to influence a lot easier than it can, you can on the floor of town meeting. Very true. So I will start by saying probably in addition to the select board meetings that happen almost every Monday or three Mondays out of the month um, that occur here at the town offices at 7.30, uh, the FinCom will start to meet almost every Wednesday at 7.30 um, here at the municipal offices as well. That, both of those avenues are a great way to come, listen to what's going on, make your voices heard. Also, you know, if you don't want to be so public about it, you're welcome to reach out to us by email, phone, um, any way that you would like. But basically, we have kicked off the FY25 budget season, believe it or not. Um, this involves putting out budgets, capital improvement plans, performance evaluations for employees so we can set colas um, going forward. It's quite an extensive process that literally starts in September and goes all the way through town meeting in May. Um, it also includes basically the annual town report that gets done in the spring um, and it includes opening the warrant in February, closing it in March and going through all of those articles that need to be on the town meeting warrant, which of course includes the budget and the capital plan. It looks like the capital committee is going to be meeting Thursday nights. That seems so far to be the best um, night. I don't know exactly what the final time is going to be on that, but you can check out My Town Gov and go to the Berlin tab and you get a list of all of our meetings and when they are um, starting and where they're located. Thank you. Uh, Chiefs, uh, Anika and Brett too. The, uh, it, Hiring is not easy in today's environment. Uh, I know we've had some turnover. What are the like staffing levels uh, and what is sort of being done to get to full staffing in each of the departments? Uh, yeah, so staffing levels have been uh, subpar. Uh, we're operating at 50%. Right now, soon to be 60, and in the next uh, few weeks, we'll be up to 70. Um, we will have two candidates for you Monday night for uh, conditional offers, those both are not academy trained uh, people. Uh, we're actually fortunate enough to get one resident um, 
on the list. Um, so uh, Kristen will be bringing them forward or bringing their names forward Monday night. Uh, they're subsequently set up for physicals and psych exams. Um, and uh, hopefully we can get them in the academy for November 27th. If not, we're looking at another three month delay. Um, but I remind you from start to finish, the day they start the academy, we're looking at nine months to get them on the road. So it's not something that's gonna be instantaneous, but uh, you know, definitely looking forward to uh, bringing staffing levels back up and obviously looking into the future. Um, a lot of people gotta realize in the next 48 months to 60 months, 50% uh, of law enforcement officers are eligible for retirement. Um, back in 96, um, like when I got hired, um, when I got hired through a federal grant and we're all hitting our 32 year mark, 30 year mark, 28 year mark. Um, so we're gonna have a mass exodus in the next four to five years of all law enforcement. That's across the country. That's just not Massachusetts, that's across the country. So yeah, there's a lot of work that has to be done over the next few years, uh, planning, uh, being ahead of the game and uh, make sure our staffing levels get up there. Um, as we know, we're um, through police reform, we're now a peace officer standards and training state uh, where we're all licensed. Um, this is the last year um, to get through all officers working to be fully licensed, uh, which then uh, required in the past, we had to do 40 hours of training a year. Now I'm budgeting at 72 hours a year um, so we can keep up with all the standards of the state and uh, my meeting this afternoon was with uh, our policy and procedures company called LexiPol, and we're going to see a significant increase in our subscription to our policy and procedures, uh, double if not triple what we're paying today uh, in order to be uh, become an accredited police department, which is our goal for June of 25, is to be a fully accredited police department. Um, like I said, we're underway with that. Uh, getting our policy and procedures up to standards, but with that comes a large cost. Um, you know, I say it's a large cost because you know we have a hundred eighteen thousand dollar budget, and we're probably going to be looking at ten percent of that just for accreditation. Um, going to accreditation, never mind um, our payroll. Um, then we have to keep it updated. Um, unfortunately, it doesn't matter if you're a two hundred person department or a two person department. Uh, requires basically one full time person to constantly monitor, update, change, uh, to stay uh, up to date with all policy and procedures across the Commonwealth. Um, like I went in today and there was a huge dump on September 28th that I did not see of uh, policy updates uh, that um, need to be out there. Um, but uh, we're working on that. And, uh, you know, it's, uh, I think it definitely like we've asked for this. Uh, Mass Chief started asking in 2013 for uh, to be a post state. Um, of course, it wasn't a popular agenda back in 2013 until the George Floyd incident and then the state uh, fast tracked it, uh, which is causing a lot of confusion. Um, uh, it's, it's not, you know, they just posted their list and it was had a, I think a five or 6% inaccuracy in their, in their postings. Uh, which uh, was unfair to you know hundreds of law enforcement officers across the state. So I think once we get on track, I think people will be more attracted to the job um, in the future once we have a solid base of what we're doing, what we expect, and uh, where we're going. It's definitely going to make us all professional uh, across the board, every department in the Commonwealth. But you know, for the time being, I think there's a lot of negative rhetoric uh, broadcasted across the news media and social media. Um, just until we can finally get to that final step. Um, but like I said, you know, we've got a lot of plans the next few years um, to hopefully curb the mass exodus that we're looking at, you know, four to five years from now. Um, you know, because I mean, basically that's 40% uh, of our department um, that will be in that, in that category. So um, we're definitely, definitely gonna pay attention to that and keep our recruiting up. If I could add on to that, if you don't mind, too, on the personnel. One of the things I've been asked to do by both the FinCom and the Personnel Committee is to put together a five-year staffing plan. So similar to what you do with a capital plan, um, but obviously on the employee side. I think this town in the past five years has experienced a tremendous amount of growth. 
and some of the departments in terms of their projects, workload, level of call volumes. Uh, we need to be able to have the staffing to keep up with uh, the volume of work and calls that are coming in. So it's, it's public safety, as Chief just mentioned, they're, they're really taking a hit right now on the police side but also the highway department. Um, there are a number of other areas where we really are struggling um, to keep up on the staffing side, just to basically maintain basic levels of services. So I'm sort of dubbed the FY25 budget the year of staffing. Um, I think the FY26 budget is going to be sort of a capital budget because we'll have the facility study done and we'll be having to look at some of the deferred maintenance that we've done uh, or we have in some of the buildings. But it is certainly something that's very much on my radar and I will be working with the department heads. In fact, they don't all know this yet, but uh, I'm meeting with them next week and we will be discussing the staffing plan that we'll be putting together. So staffing and fire department, uh, we're, we're, we're down from where I would like to see us. Um, we're actively recruiting, trying to bring people on. Um, one of the issues that I think we're running into is trying to do background checks and get that done utilizing the police department because their priority is obviously, you know, trying to get their full-time members taken care of. Um, you know, we're looking at the same issues of bringing people on and bringing them into the department, and they're probably, you know, eight months to a year before they're going to be certified. Um, and able to actually start, you know, benefiting us on the uh, on being able to be counted on to be part of the ambulance crew or the uh, initial uh, fire crew going out the door. Um, you know, call volume is kind of up. The severity of the calls are up, um, and we're yeah. And this is uh, the same as the police. It's across the country. It's the volunteer and call departments aren't um, the, the the interest isn't there anymore. So it's trying to recruit people to bring in, um, and then the if you will the ill effect to that is also for full-time departments you don't have as many people because um, that used to be what fed the full-time departments was the call and volunteers <clears throat> so we're we're actively trying to figure out new ways to recruit and retain our employees so that's going to be something i think for the next couple of years that's going to be at the forefront for us to look at to come up with different ways of attracting people to come in um, and to be involved and then if i understand it for both police and fire mm -hmm. Uh, the state regulations now is that a part-time person really needs to have the exact same level of training, the number of hours and other stuff as a full-time person at this point, correct? Yeah, yes, the certifications are the same for uh, being an EMT or a firefighter. It's the same hours, it's the same classes, there's, there's no difference. Um, and that's my understanding for the police department as well. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it's uh, the, the, the levels, our trainings are the same. Uh, my mandates for my staff, whether they are call firefighters, um, part-time firefighters, which I'm looking at trying to get more to fill some of our vacancies, but there's a shortage out there of them. Um, and full-time firefighters, their training uh, every month to keep their credentials up is the same. They're all taking the same training, and they're in here every month on the same nights to take the same trainings together. Right, so those part-time positions aren't necessarily as appealing as they used to be, because if you need to do all the same training, you might as well work a full-time job Correct. instead of just doing that as a, as a side thing. Yes, and I'm looking at the, the new ones that I'm trying to get on the department that are uh, 18 or 19 years old that are just coming out of high school and stuff. Uh, in, in full transparency, I'm looking at having them for about three to five years before I'm going to lose them to a full-time department, just because most of them coming in seem to be that this is something that they want to make a career out of. Mm -hmm. They're excited about coming on. But I know, you know, just from, you know, the, the way it works, it, that excitement will turn into a full-time job offer from somebody else because all of the other departments have openings, you know, and it, eventually that's where they'll go. <laughs> Thanks. You're welcome. Good. Brad, how are we doing on highway with staffing? All right, so our staffing, we would just had uh, one guy short. I left in August. Um, right now I'm in the process of uh, reaching out to set up interviews for next week. Uh, we have two definite candidates, one possible. Um, and the position uh, when Brendan had started was it was split 50-50 between um, like a custodian uh, and then as the 50% uh, highway. Um, we've since changed it to be 100% uh, within the buildings uh, because it just got to the point where uh, the buildings are over 20 years old, uh, even the, the municipal center. Uh, and it just got to the point where, you know, things aren't being upkept the way they should be. Um, and I just couldn't like jump up and leave a job to come down here to you know to change a light bulb real quick or anything like that because it stops work on the highway um so i spoken with Kristen and um we we 
came to terms to, uh, to put a person here uh, full time um, just to help maintain the buildings and everything. Uh, as much as I wanted the full time guy on the highway, um, this was more a priority right now um, to help us out. Uh, so hopefully uh, in the next couple of weeks, uh, you know, we'll have an offer for the select board. silly question that I always have a question so over the weekend the drone was up in the back um, have you used the drone I noticed that there were a couple incidents over the weekend where you had to go find someone on Pisca so could you let us uh, tell everybody about the drone and how awesome it is all right so the incident you talk about on Pisca uh, fortunately the fire department in the town has a hiker that is much faster than a drone that went 1.24 miles in and out in uh, less than 45 minutes, uh, which would uh, be the gentleman in the uh, lime green to the left of us, along with uh, one of the firefighters, Michelle, um, that uh, are avid hikers. Uh, it was raining, so there was a delay in us uh, deploying the drone. But earlier in the week, there was a missing 23-year-old uh, autistic uh, person from Clinton um, that we had records um, of, of finding in uh, conservation areas. Uh, so we spent uh, five or six hours, uh, police and fire, flying the drones uh, over Pleasant Street, the uh, Lester Ross Dam area down there, uh, as well as the Suasco, cover the Suasco, uh, just to eliminate areas um, of concern that we had. Uh, fortunately, the person was located the next morning uh, in, in Marlboro behind Price Chopper, uh, safe and well, um, but had been missing for 48 hours. Uh, but yeah, yeah, we have uh, we have been up there and uh, and uh, getting used to it, and uh, there's a lot to learn. Um, we realized uh, how powerful the cameras are, and they're definitely to our advantage. So uh, yeah, it was a, a great uh, turned out to be a training exercise, uh, which was good uh, for everybody. But uh, yeah, we're just looking forward to setting it up more. Yeah, uh, so the infrared does multiple um, multiple colors, which we got to train with. Uh, you know, like we learned that we can't use uh, red and white over water because it turns the water red. Um, but, uh, you know, we, we definitely used the white a lot and uh, it uh, worked out great. Uh, we thought we had a, a hit and it turned out to be a frog. At 167 feet, we were able to zoom right in on the, on the frog and uh, realized that the heat was coming from a, a little frog sitting on a lily pad. And I was just going to follow up on that with the drone use on Saturday night. I think, uh, you know, obviously uh, kudos to Lieutenant Cummings and Firefighter DeVoe who uh, made it up there so quickly. Um, it, the, I have no doubt that that drone would have been deployed and the heat signatures, they would have been able to pinpoint exactly where that person was. Um, but to, to, just to reiterate what Chief Shartner said, it was raining that night and just because we had found the hiker instead of putting the drones out and, you know, risking damaging them. That was why the decision was made not to deploy them. But if we hadn't found that hiker, we would have deployed those assets and taken that risk just to find that person. But um, as, as he had stated, the, the capabilities and what you can see with that camera is incredible. Sure. So either Chief Shatner or Kristen. Um, is there any update from Congressman Trahan's office on the funding for the radio project? Yes, there is. Uh, good news. So we hope to hear in December, or we will hear in December. Um, it is made it through all of the hoops so far. So um, uh, Peg is referring to a $400,000 grant uh, or actually it's sort of like a federal earmark that we requested through Lori Trahan's office through her community funding program. And it would be the first time that Berlin ever received funding through her office before. Uh, it's a very exciting project to update our radios to do the phase three, which would be an adding another tower would add a huge amount of coverage to have that third site. Um, where we could have, uh, you know, additional coverage throughout town. So I did actually speak with uh, her regional chief of staff about two weeks ago. Everything is moving as it should. Um, they are cautiously optimistic was the words that were used. So we're, we're really hopeful um, that it will go through, but we will know shortly. Believe it or not, December is right around the corner. 
And, and to be clear, the coverage is not necessarily like cell phone coverage. This is for our emergency broadcasts and our police and fire to have better coverage and better communication during emergencies. Yes, yes. that's correct. Um, is there anyone in the audience who wants to ask any questions? Uh, if not, I think we might be done. I want to thank all the department heads, the chiefs, you know, Kristen, for, for coming out here tonight, the people who are here tonight, and those people who are watching on the phone, mm -hmm. or on the phone, on the TV, you know, they're all about the same. Uh, thank you very much, and we'll see you soon.